Next speaker, uh, let me introduce, uh, it's a Jamie Park, um, um, whose topic, uh, whose presentation uh, um, is entitled Elderly Poverty in South Korea, How Tradition Falters in a Fast Growing Economy. By the way, this two presentation is uh, um, categorized under sex, gender, age issue in Asia. Thank you. So Louis, can you give uh, co-host status to Jamie Park? Yeah, uh, sorry, how do I uh, do that? Thank you, I'm actually already co-host, so you okay, don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. All right. Uh, sweet, I'll just go ahead and share my PowerPoint. There we go. Can you guys all see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Um, Thank you for coming, everyone. My name is Jamie Park, and I'm a student at OCAD University studying criticism and curatorial practice. Um, today, I'll be discussing elder poverty in South Korea, how tradition falters in a fast growing economy. So here we have a picture of an elder uh, with a cart loaded, filled with um, cardboard boxes and other types of recyclables, which they later turn it in for money. And this is actually how a lot of elders in South Korea are making their living day to day. At the end of a full day worth of labor, they make about four to five dollars, uh, four to five thousand Korean won, which is equivalent to like three to four dollars Canadian. And it actually barely covers like for their one meal of the day or any kind of other kind of needs that they need throughout the day. And in 2015, it was reported that 2 million elders li are living like this in South Korea, making their livings through collecting recyclables and turning it in for money. So to dive deeper, we are gonna question what is elder poverty? Elder poverty is a social and fiscal phenomenon where demographics 65 and older are in poverty. And in South Korea, um, this problem is much more prevalent than in any other OECD nations, as you can see in the chart we have on the side. Um, in South Korea, the elder poverty rate hit 43.8% in, in 2017, meaning that one in two elders are in poverty. This is a crucial problem in South Korea because South Korea is already an aged society where 14% of the population are elders, meaning that the country is becoming more and more elder dependent as the days go by. Um, to understand the problem of elder poverty and how we, how South Korea began, came to have this problem and understand the development of it, we look at three different factors, which are income disparity, late development of the pension program, and thirdly, the change in family structure. When looking at income disparity, we look at rapid economic growth in post-war Korea. South Korea um, came out of war in 1953, and in 1953, they were just completely war-torn country. There were lots of hunger, uh, hungry people, starving people, and poors, and um, people who had their families ripped apart from them in 1953, and that was the situation of South Korea. But in just about a couple, like in just about three decades, South Korea became the tenth largest economy in the world by 1980s. A lot of people call this the miracle of Han River. Um, this development was all led under Park jong government, who became president in 1963. His um, development uh, plan focused heavily on foreign aid and business conglomerates within the country. So he focused and depended on foreign aids like USA and Japan's monetary aid and loans. Um, he cha also changed the development plan of the economic development plan to uh, export-led economy. Um, so he focused more on transportation, manufacturing, electric power, and exported South Korean labor and the global market for their um, competitive prices and high comp competency compared to the rest of the world. Um, the monetary aid and loans uh, financed most of Can uh, South Korea's exports that between 1953 and 1962, American funds financed 70% of South Korea's imports and accounted for 80% of total fixed capital formation. However, this heavy dependence on USA and Japan's monetary loans and aids and um, so focusing of Chaebars, which are business conglomerates in Korea, came to haunt them back later because it created an unstable economic grounding for South Korea. 
walls and opportunities were not spread out evenly throughout Korea, and it created great wealth and equality within South Korean classes. To get away from, uh, to justify this inequality and to justify the favoritism of Shebers and court elite classes within the country, the government instead focused and enforced Confucian and nationalist ideals where they put forth the nation's development over individual sacrifices. So the uh, country continued to exploit the working class and working age population and labor in the world, uh, in the global market. And they were actually the leaders of the miracle of Han in 60s, 70s, and 80s. However, it's ironic because um, this population that led the um, miracle of Han are, is the population that is now in poverty in South Korea currently in 2020 in 2021 and continuously. <clears throat> And in problems of export-led economy, uh, as the country focused purely on export-led economy, uh, many other private se sectors like agricultural sector fell behind. Uh, in the beginning of 1970, the agricultural sector's contribution to South Korean GDP was 47%. And in just 10 years, it dropped down to 20 29%. The decline of the agricultural share in GDP happened as fast and as compressed as the speed of the economic development. Um, OECD 1999 states that its average percentage decrease was slightly above 4% per annum during the 1970s and 1980s and accelerated to 5% in the first half of 1990. However, al although the contribution of the um, agricultural sector is contribution to South Korean GDP continued to decline. Through introduction of technology, um, the agricultural production continued to increase. And technology also took over many parts of the agricultural labor, so the agricultural employment rate also declined. Just within 10 years, from 1960 to 1970, there was 50% decrease in agricultural employment rate, meaning that 2.5 million South Koreans lost their jobs or transitioned out of the agricultural labor field. By 1997, people over the age of 50 covered about 47% of the agricultural working population. And as you can see, the older, older working population was alienated from income generating activities as the agricultural sector continued to be alienated from the government's um, wealth distribution activities and income generating activities. In study by Nozaki and Oshio, multidimensional poverty and perceived happiness, they were able to find that income deprivation was the key contributor in elderly poverty in three other um, East Asian economic powerhouses. Based on this chart, you can see that South Korea actually has the biggest age group difference between people in poverty, showing almost 15% difference between the younger generation and the older generation and the poverty cut and the poverty cutoff. So based on this chart, you can find that um, in South Korea, uh, income deprivation is the biggest key factor in elder poverty problem. The government focused on the country's development over the people and their sacrifices, and they continue to alienate their own workers throughout the years. And um, you can see this from the late development of the National Pension Scheme, which was only developed in 1988. The demographic who brought wealth to the nation is the demographic that are now in poverty in South Korea. While some may argue that the government did try to take care of it, the alienated people and the marginalized people in South Korea, um, they, their efforts weren't really guided towards the working population. Instead, the social welfare and subsidies between the periods of 1945 and 1988 focused um, primarily in three different groups, which were families in social welfare situation, families without breadwinners, and families of soldiers and policemen who died at work. The other types of social welfare and subsidy, um, subsidy systems that they had was the Joseon Poor Law and Protection of Minimum Living Standards Act, which um, protected children under 13 and elders aged over 65, pregnant women and the disabled. So many people continue to fall behind the government's economic development plan, as well as the government's social welfare and subsidies program, especially the aging population. Little to no care was given to the working aging population of the time. 
what we now know as the South Korean Pension Program was, or, or the National Pension Scheme was only developed in 1988. It finally considered the working class population and the middle aged demographics. However, it was a contributory insurance scheme providing earnings related benefits. And it was also uh, established way too late for the working population to reap any kinds of benefit in their, um, once they retired. And at the time of its development or an introduction, the cleavage between economic classes within South Korea was already too great. So the national pension scheme didn't provide any kind of security to the working population or the working class. Um, in 2013, they noted that only 31.9% of the elders benefited from the national pension scheme, which did not help to relieve the elder poverty problem in South Korea at all, since there is still 43. 7% of elders that are living in poverty day to day. Another problem, we, another contributory factor we have is the change in family structures. And when it comes to the question of who is responsible for taking care of the elders and supporting them, the government pushed responsibilities to their children, emphasizing patriarchal norms, filial piety, and Confucian ideals. Um, so children were in charge of their taking care of taking care of their elders through, through uh, constant cultural um, enforcement of you have to fulfill your filial piety, you have to take care of your elders. And the government just didn't really um, take on the responsibility of taking, their el taking care of the elders in the, in the country. In a standard South Korean family structure, um, the expected role of the eldest son is to take care of their parents take care of their elderly parents by living with them, support younger siblings, bring success to the family and continue the family line. However, um, with modernization and coming into the 2000s, a lot of things have changed. Um, there were a lot of family structures and a lot of family traditions were left behind. Less and less adult children live with their parents. Many denied the longstanding family traditions such as the Chesa, which is the yearly um, ancestral ceremony that South Koreans do to memorize, uh, commemorate and celebrate their ancestors and um, remember them. And there's also the increase in immigration, which cor directly correlates with the problem of less adult children living with their elderly parents. There's also the increase in elder divorce rate, which is actually contributing to the higher number of females within elder poverty rate in South Korea. As the family structure in South Korea continues to break down, more and more elders are finding themselves in relative poverty. And although there was a drop, and with less and less adult children living with their adult parents, there's actually a drop of uh, from 80% to 60% between the years of 1980 and just 2000. Within just 20 years, there was about 30% drop in um, elders living with their children. However, um, the elders are in continual need of their children's support. Financial transfers from non-co-resident children is crucial to the elders' economic well-being. In 1980, private transfers counted for 72% of the total income for people over 60, meaning that um, a lot of elders just depended on their children's um, monetary funds and aids and so, since they were not really participating in, uh, in, world, in, um, in the country's economy and doing income generating activities. And in 2003, the private transfers counted for 31% of the total income. So even the adult children's monetary support is continuing to decline as the years go by. Despite the drop in rate, financial transfers are still crucial in relieving elder poverty and income inequality. 26.5% um, of the elder poverty gap is actually filled by private transfers. So you can, under, you can see that um, it is still the children's um, responsibility to relieve elders' poverty instead of the government's systemic um, pension program or any kind of support that will um, relieve them from poverty. The real poverty rate in co-resident elders is actually also much lower, showing that elders are continuing to depend on their children. What South Korea needs to relieve them from elder poverty is a sustainable support system that does not rely on family structures and filial piety. 
the government needs to develop a better pension scheme, which will, um, which is preferably not based on a contributory fact, uh, contributory based um, pension scheme that will not really reap enough benefits for them by their by the time they retire. And an effective, uh, and thirdly, the increased elderly participation in society. And we need an elderly oriented organization and we need to bring them out to the society more so that they can continue to um, participate in um, the country's economy as the country becomes more and more elder dependent as we enter an aged society with the decline in birth rate and everything. Um, to reduce elder poverty, we need to look for new ways to support elders in a sustainable way that does not depend on tradition of Confucianism and family roles. And only then can South Korea actually properly adjust to this shift of changing our society to an aged society and resolve the issues, of fo issues following the elder poverty. And thank you. Thank you for that. Um, um, I was muted for 30 seconds and I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so thank you very much for, um, I think my screen is a strange. Why Louis is uh, the, it's in my center of my screen still. <laughs> Louis, um, is the same for you guys? Louis' name is in the center of my screen. No. no, not for me. Oh, no. Okay, so it's a, my poor management of my screen. Okay, all right. <laughs> so I think I should just uh, click Jamie. All right, add pin. I think I should pin Jamie. Okay, uh, Louis is still um, as if he appeared in my screen as if he's the speaker. So let me just, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, thank you very much, Jamie. That's a subject that uh, I'm not muted, right, right now. Am no, I? you're not. Okay. Um, uh, seldom spoken about subject in the uh, forum of young person, young people, because it's elderly issue often uh, neglected, and especially in the context of yes, in the uh, country like South Korea. And I'm very curious about what other Asian society um, are how they dealing with because we have uh, similar heritage in, in terms of Confucianism. Um, how the role of family is more emphasized than society when it comes to the generations issue and elderly care. So yeah, I'm, I wanna open up the discussion to um, audience, please. Any questions or comments, please? Christy has a question. Christy has a question, I can see that, yes. Uh, hi, Jamie, can you hear me? Hi, Christy. Yep. Yeah. I can hear you. Um, thank you for the great presentation. I definitely could uh, relate to the topic of um, elderly in uh, South Korea because when I was um, living in Hong Kong, I've definitely noticed um, that there were a lot of elderly people that were living in poverty. And I actually worked uh, uh, volunteer hours to go help it, um, uh, to give food to the elderly. And like, it was shocking, like the living conditions and just how like, you know, how much, um, how, like, how they don't have a lot of aid in terms mm -hmm. of um, support for elderly people in Hong Kong. And even sometimes, like, when I uh, go to McDonald's at night, you would see elderly people just sleeping on the benches of the fast food places. So to me, this topic is really close to, like, close to home, too, even though it's in a different um country in Asia. I feel like that's very related to most of the countries, I think. And especially in the big cities like Seoul, Hong Kong, and um, maybe other Asian uh, countries as well. And I really like that you talked about the familial structure too, about how like the elderly, um, the oldest in the family has to take care of the elderly as well. Um, and, and in terms of that, like, yeah, I just wanted to just make that uh, comment that I feel like you've touched a lot of things that are very um, relatable in terms of um, <clears throat> other Asian uh, cultures as well because we have the same sort of uh, structure and I think it, I totally agree with you that that really needs to change 
because I feel like, and even in my dad's generation, he also had the same issue that like he had to take care of my grandparents, but my dad had no time to take care of them. He had to take care of us and the whole family. So yeah, um, I don't know whether you want to maybe talk a bit more about the generational like differences between maybe the elderly and like our generation. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it's really good that you actually brought up the problem of elder poverty in China as well, because it was in, during my research, I actually couldn't find a lot of information on Chinese poverty as um, most as like the Chinese statistics continue to state that China has completely freed the nation of poverty all throughout together. Um, but I hear these stories of like elders uh, sleeping on, in McDonald's in China and it's just that I wasn't able to find any kind of proper statistics on it. And um, in terms of generation, I think within Korea, like um, I talked about the rapid economic growth in South Korea and it was before that South Korea was um, going through war and that's where um, the where going through work, they would already have been going through a lot of poverty because of the situation of the war. And even during then, it was actually the eldest son's responsibility to find a safe haven for their family members. Or a lot of times, these eldest son would be drafted to war. And it's actually it was actually like the females left behind at home having to take care of their family members. And having to make livings for them. And that's when, gov when the government actually did try to support these alienated people, um, but it wasn't really the working population since they, were, they would have all been at war at the time. And yeah. No, that's a really good insight, yeah. I didn't like, yeah, no, I really like your um, response with that, thank you. <laughs> um, I see Tina with her hand. Hi. Yeah, so going back to your presentation, I was wondering about like, um, like elders who don't have children. Have they been like taken into consideration at all, like by the government? Um, so the government do the do have like, um, like subsidies and welfare programs for elders. It's just that uh, from what I've read and like personal experiences that I was able to look into, a lot of elders, although they do get like monthly living expenses from the government, it all they have to also pay the government for their monthly living expense. So it's a very funny um, system where they receive money to live from the government, but they also have to pay the government to continue living. So at the end of the day, those subsidies and welfare, uh, welfare checks that they get are left with just like a couple dollars out. It's just gonna buy them maybe like a bag of rice or something. So it's a lot of people are actually falling through the gaps. And yeah. Thank you so much. Hey, Soyang, you're actually muted. I have uh, something to add uh, there. The, because it's a question on if it is uh, traditionally heavily rely on the family support, what if, if you are elderly without family? Yes, that's a good question because mm -hmm. in, the, in that case, uh, government in fact uh, do recognize that the person are actually do not have a support. So does have a different scheme, but as soon as they find out, let's say a son who live in different city, but who has economic means, they recognize that and they would not pay thing to the elderly and expect, as your presentation indicates, expect that um, the ch uh, children who has this car, uh, who ha have income level of this are supposed to actually pay or take care of the elderly, their parents. And so um, uh, the elderly is supposed to pay, uh, receive less, less paycheck or something like that. So the system is really rely on, yes, the traditional filial relations. And there are a lot of this evasion of duties and, you know, and which is, again, it's very gray areas. And, and oftentimes also one last one, which I recently encountered because my father passed away and then all this inheritance and those issues. Um, 
many parents, um, because their love of children, they give up their positions, give out those money before their, before they, <laughs> they give their money to their children expect with expectation of getting it returned. Um, and but that uh, unsaid contract is faltering in Korea. Many children run away with the money, the parents' property, which now become they become the owner of, and the, the parents are, are, are abandoned basically. Then the recent trend is the parents are actually um, um, suing children which is like, wow, in Confucian society, yes, that's a sign of modernity, that parents now swing, return those, uh, the, the possessions that I have inherited you, and uh, now I need to get it back. Anyways, that's the situation, and I'm curious to do more research myself, what happened in Japan or Hong Kong and Taiwan <laughs> and other countries, and it's socialist China as well. Yeah. Actually, in um, Japan, the problem is uh, pretty similar to South Korea as well. I've seen some articles where they say that um, elders in Japan are actually turning themselves, uh, actually committing like petty crimes to get themselves into jail, mm -hmm. where they will actually have proper shelter, proper food, like three meals a day, and proper protection from the cold and whatnot. So the situation is as devastating in Japan as it is in South Korea. Wow. Okay. You know what? We have a, 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 a little note from the coordinator that maybe it's uh, we are getting very delayed in terms of our schedule. So thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for um, wonderful thought-provoking questions. So uh, we need to move on to the next segment of, of uh, presentations, uh, arts and protest and memories. In fact, Despite that we are slightly delayed, we have a lot of guests actually who are very interested in this uh, event, this particular presentations, uh, because it's a focus of our first day. I happen to have the guests from France and from Korea with regard to that. And so I have also obligations. So next two speakers will be Tina uh, Ari, uh, Ariaza and Abunet uh, Daliwar. Um, However, for the context of discussion, um, please allow me to just give a quick uh, two minutes uh, uh, background because there is some, um, the modification of schedule, which I didn't share because I was rushing out of the time. And so let me just share the screens. Uh, what was the uh, little uh, surprise uh, event that we supposed to have? So those who stayed here from the beginning, sorry, this is just my father's face, right? We were talking about how the Asia is um, in the volatile place where um, a lot of uh, protests currently um, are for, against authoritarianism, against feudalism, uh, for the democracy, against um, um, uh, uh, unfair policies are taking place. And so this is a little, little mashup that I have created which kind of contextualized the, uh, the, the two talks that we're going to present uh, today. Uh, despite of the span of time of 30, last 30 years, it's all interconnected. Image you are looking at right now are, this is actually image from Myanmar right now uh, in the recent month, uh, the protest that live or, free, or die, freedom is worth it. And this one is um, uh, actually image of Myanmar uh, police uh, shooting at um, uh, citizens, pro uh, democracy seeking citizens. And um, in particular incidents that captured here, uh, 18 people died. And uh, before then we have seen the, through the international news protest for, um, for democracy in Thailand. Thailand does not belong to the king. You can see that in the signages. And this one is an uh, image of uh, Indian farmers who've been protesting, which are going to be subject of Abnet, uh, the second speaker from now on. And this is the image of actually, I uh, Googled actually the Myanmar protest and this image came out. And quite touchingly, um, these are solidarity protests uh, from South Korea. South Korea uh, and young people are sending their support to Myanmar uh, uh, citizens fight for democracy. 
the connection to 1980s. This is the image of 1980 Gwangju uprising or Gwangju massacre, which is very important background of Minjung art that uh, Tina uh, Arizana, my students are, are going to be presenting in a minute, which is a foremost example of art for protest in, in, in South Korea in 1980s, uh, which South Korea has become one of the shining example of Asian democracy, uh, bottom up democratization movement, which is captured through this moment has been succeeded and democracy tradition has been happening. And the art object that uh, Ariana um, uh, de Tina will be talking about is coming from a uh, artic particular art movement called Minjung art. This is like one of exemplary, um, the woodblock prints, which is also categorized as Minjung arts, are created, circulated during the time when these photojournalistic imageries of police beating people, citizens, the citizens themselves um, uh, raid the uh, police station and take over the weapons and try to protect the citizens' right against the paratroopers sent by government which is in fact hauntingly echoed in current event in Myanmar. This image was never censored. It was a censor never seen for two decades. Thus, this art movement, art images, Minjung art images was to replace what was censored images that only came into the lights um, after democratization, after 20 years later. So I'm just juxtaposing how all these images and art for protest images are interconnected and has a huge currency right now. Let me give my podium to Tina uh, right now. Let me just stop share. Tina, are you ready to present your work, please? Yep, I'm ready. Okay, so Tina um, is a drawing and painting student and whose uh, presentation is entitled Minjung Art, I just uh, briefly mentioned, Decolonizing Aesthetics in South Korea. Thank you very much, Tina. Okay. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm just gonna introduce myself. Hello everyone, my name is Tina and I'm gonna graduate from OCAD soon with a major in drawing and painting and a minor in art history. And my presentation is about the success of Minjung art through its decolonizing aesthetics in South Korea. So the recent history of Korea is important in the context of Minjung art because it is a factor of influence as well as a driving force. So Korea dealt with uh, Americanization and the Western periphery almost the entirety of the 20th century. Uh, Japan violently colonized uh, Korea for the first half and after its end, Korea had to deal with the following cultural domination from the United States, along with their presence in the form of military bases in South Korea. This is vital in relation to the periphery because not only was this type of governing extremely oppressive, but it was the continuation of non-direct self-colonization, which in addition was very much apparent during Japanese colonial colonialism due to, due to their use of the Western model in order to control uh, Korea. So after the Gwangju uprising, which resulted in hundreds of pro-democracy civilians dying at the hands of military forces, Minjung art rose and ended up playing a vital role in the democratization of South Korea. Hence its success as an art movement in the con context of identity and aesthetics. Korean artists uh, effort to resist American Americanization, reach democracy and rise above the periphery was a success because they masterfully created an art movement in which art was contextualized within uniquely Korean aesthetics as well as the Korean experience, allowing the artists to make work in relation to their own experiences, tra traumas, and struggles. So this allowed uh, for the role of the artists in Minjung art to be vital in Korean society during its time, making them influential and directly responsible for South Korea's transition into democracy nearing the end of the 20th century. 
So one concept that arguably made Minjung art a success was the use of Han. Minjung artists incorporated Han in order to express their politically driven works. Uh, Han was particularly unique to Koreans, which essentially translates to the emotion of unresolved resentment or trauma regarding unresolved injustice, making one's body quiver with the helpless need to get revenge, but not be able to. So I'm quoting, uh, as Sebastian Kim explained, Minjung artists made a significant impact on the movement by providing a platform for expressing people's Han and, exp and aspirations. The artists were working alongside Minjung theologians, but were particularly effective among students and ordinary people who were campaigning against military-backed government because of human right abuse. So this particular concept was very important and was successfully carried out in Minjung woodblock prints, which masterfully used uniquely Korean aesthetics and techniques in order to express this particular emotion, as well as demonstrate a type of communal art that represented a mass number of people who were being overlooked and as a result experiencing the same struggles. So my first artist that I will be talking about is Oyun. Um, Oyun's woodblock prints focused on peasants, the elderly, and laborers. So the usage of woodblock made these prints cheap in production, giving the artist the ability to duplicate the same images quickly and effectively. In addition, these artworks made by Oyun were particularly effective because they shone light on the reality of the Korean people using exclusively Asian aesthetics and techniques that as Soyoung Park explained, utilized everyday narratives over the aesthetic formalism of the earlier art movement, Korean monochrome. So first example, the work Dawn for Labor 1984, as an example, uh, successfully demonstrates the hardships of a laborer at the hands of industrialization, echoing the reality at hand in which justice couldn't possibly coexist with prosperity. As Sebastian Kim explains, when government and company owners insisted that for the sake of economic prosperity and security in a competitive capitalist market, market workers needed to sacrifice, the Minjung protagonists were arguing that for justice, that they were arguing that justice for the workers needed to be achieved first, and that prosperity and justice are not mutually exclusive. This is extremely crucial in understanding the artwork because it is essentially demonstrating the fact that for prosperity to exist, the sacrifices of the masses were solely needed. What this says about industrialization is that without the hard work of peasants and laborers, as well as their sacrifices, the society in relation is inevitably doomed and that a whole other system is desperately needed. So as Soyoung Park explains, the widening disparity of wealth and persistent economic injustice continue to exacerbate the sense of alienation among the unprivileged masses, while the expanding spectacular of, spectacle of consumer goods continue to project the illusion of happiness for all. For all. So the same sentiment uh, is particularly apparent in uh, Kim Jong-un's Lucky Minorium Guarantees Prosperous Life in 1981. This work also critiqued the system in which the masses are oppressed, making commentary on consumerism by juxtapositioning the poor labor and the middle class prosperity. The artist's choice of such an alienation between the two sections of the painting directly and but satirically critiques the flooring brand Lucky Minorium and how it promises to grant prosperity when the poor laborer struggles long hours in order to survive. So the disconnect is clearly shown through the isolation of two subjects in the painting, the laborer and the middle class, the middle class furnished home. Through this critiquing of the government and the system using Korean art context, Minjung art achieved what monochrome previously couldn't. Monochrome's formalist concerns with an aesthetic identity blocked them from reaching Minjung Art's critical assessment of Korean context and Korean identity because it lacked what the society needed from contemporary art in that moment. Similarly, Hong Sung Dem's, draw, uh, Hong Sung Dem's art 
draws upon the same themes in his works, focusing on the common people of Korea using techniques within the Korean context. As Volk Kuster explains, Hong draws frequently upon traditional Korean stylistics, profiting from having been trained in Buddhist paintings um, and from restoring old Korean cultural assets with his master. So the artist's explicit use of this kind of training is the reflection of Minjong art's revival of popular traditions such as Buddhist and shamanistic art, genre painting, folk art, and mask dances that turned against the elite art movements like Korean monochrome that were um, previously critiqued to be directly influenced by the West, specifically art for art's sake. Uh, Hung's use of woodcuts also allowed him to create many prints cost effectively. He spent an entire decade after the Guangzhou uprising um, by creating woodblocks prints that depict episode of the common people's experiences. Um, these can be categorized in three categories, with the first being political resistance, the second being sketches from everyday life, and the third being cultural religious motives. These prints include highly politicized imagery as well as emotional ones. Collectively, they come together and form an identity that is uniquely Korean contemporary and hold aesthetic value as well as critical value. Um, to begin with, the late laborer Chun Tae-il, 1986, references the activist Chun Tae-il who set himself on fire in order to protest unfair labor conditions. This was a crucial act of protest and activism and is being depicted through this print effectively. Um, other prints like Let's Go to the Provincial Province Hall 1988 and Mother 1982 also reference recent struggles of industrialization with the first print depicting a street fight between protesters and the police and the second print capturing uh, the Han experienced by Korean mothers working hard to give their sons better lives. These works are successful in capturing Korea's identity by confronting Korea's recent history that still affects the present. By doing so, the artist is facing the issues head on instead of choosing to hide from them and create a kind of amnesia in which important history, regardless of how painful or shameful, is forgotten and inevitably repeated again. Works from the second category, uh, sketches from everyday life, such as Night Work 2, 1984, depict the somewhat gory outcomes of the hard work done by laborers. One particular figure that is especially concerning and central to the work is the woman on the right, uh, bleeding from her nose, most likely experiencing symptoms of extreme exhaustion. Um, Murals uh, were also important, uh, and also were also an important medium that Minjung artists used to have their voices heard. This particular medium was powerful due to its size that resulted in more powerful imagery. The Guangzhou uprising, followed by its many deaths, called for these types of artworks. So um, what the Guangzhou uprising followed by its many deaths called for these types of artworks in order to actively resist the government and reach out to the public in communal grievance and uprising. Hong Sung Dam himself was captured by the police for such works. As Volker Kuster explains, uh, Hong had sent the slides of the mural painting, The History of National Liberation Movement of Korea, of which the original had been destroyed by South Korean police, was reconstructed there in its original format by North Korean artists. Hong was tortured and put into solitary confinement. Um, so this, this mural, um, another critical mural related to the same issues brought up by the Guangzhou uprising was the one done by Cheongnam National University in 1980. This mural represents and includes both men and women, as well as children, students, and the general working class civilians in one large work, showing that each group has a part to play in this uprising. Everyone is fighting against the same force and everyone wants the same thing. Through this depiction, the work is successfully capturing the Korean society's reality and at the same time offering hope by promoting people to join the protest. 
Um, additionally, people were also suffering from other matters at hand, including the division of the North and South, which resulted in issues like families being separated and only being able to see each other at the border occasionally. Uh, this mural and later woodblock, Dreaming of Reunification, 1983 and 1987 by Lee Chol Su, portrays the suffering or Han, effectively depicting the North and South as people who are hugging each other and not wanting to let go. Not only is this work effective because of the Korean woodblock aesthetic, but it also utilizes a uniquely East Asian folklore and in that way turning the work into a narrative that is understandable in the Korean context. As Sebastian Kim explains, the cloud bridge in the background portrays the East Asian folk story of the weaver girl and the cowherd who were separated and only meet once a year in heaven. The concept of Han is again very much present in this piece because this desire to reunite is one that is far from being accomplished at the time and for the many years to come, with the South desperately needing democratization instead of a military driven government who is already very anti communist. So in conclusion, Minjung Art successfully utilized its own Korean context and identity in order to create works that were not only visually powerful in relation to the issues at hand, but also had a direct hand in triggering and creating real change and leading South Korea to accomplish democratization. The works created were extremely relevant to the majority of society suffering from the hands of military and the government. And they also directly dealt with the emotional trauma caused by the indirect colonialism experienced by the masses over the last century. The works discussed are unique in their aesthetic and their context, creating a powerful identity of the Korean people and leaving a mark unlike any other in history. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so let me just uh, modify my views and galleries. Thank you, Tina, for those um, extremely informative, um, um, uh, illustrative, um, actually an unraveling of Min Jung art, one of very important um, uh, form of, of art for social change uh, in, in, in East Asia. And, and um, any comments? Let me just, I'm a Minjung art scholar myself, and I was part of the movement as well in the 1990s, early 1990s. So I think I should refrain myself uh, from making comments here and inviting others to ask questions and comments, please. Anyone, please? Is there anything in the chat box? Uh, Angelina. Angelina. Uh, I can see Angelina's hands, please. Hi, um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question, uh, two questions kind of related. Uh, so I was wondering how these prints were circulated originally and how they're treated now and preserved. Um, so I'm not sure how they were distributed. Um, I've actually only known about, oh yeah, go ahead, Soyan, you probably know, yeah, for well, sure. I, um, I'm a direct, um, I have a first-hand experience of those things, yes. It was really, uh, it was not a, a era of internet, as you know, the 1980s, uh, it was, there was no internet and also uh, mainstream media is heavily censored. So these are actually produced basically, uh, hand-delivered and spread around from one city to another really in bunch. <laughs> and that you send out by mail, basically, like the way the traditional newspaper are delivered to home. And then you should, of course, hide yourself exchanging these things because it's a breach of, um, a breach of, um, yes, the, the terms of censorship that you're not supposed to represent image of Gwangju uprising. You're not supposed to represent the um, figurative image of people who are suffering and because it's not what authoritarian government like to see and they found that all these uh, protest artists are um, they named as um, inflammatory they are subversive and they are maybe commits in conversation with the north korea or something like that, all this labeling going on to suppress them so anyways that's my little sharing information but tina you can answer second part of question um 
I forget what the second question was. Was it how it was documented? So it seems, uh, as So Young said, at first these were circulated in a very secretive way. Uh, I wonder if they were circulated with text as well. But uh, I'm wondering how these things, these visual works are preserved, if they have been preserved, and how they are exhibited today in a contemporary context, because they're a very rich part of the history. Um, in regards to Oyun's wood, wood block prints, um, I found a, a book uh, from OKIU's library. Everything is digital now because I can't actually go to the library, but um, the, all of his works were um, actually scanned and in really good quality. So um, I'm not sure how, maybe they were collected, but all of his work was in that book and um, it was um, explained, like everything was, was there in very good quality. So I'm not sure like how they were collected. Maybe Soyan, you can, if you have any knowledge of that. Um, yes, and so in fact, I have missed um, important announcement. We have a surprise guest from Korea who is directly involved in also Min Jung art movement who can answer all these questions also himself. Um, uh, this is, um, if you don't mind, um, I actually, when I could share my screen, I could have shared this one. Uh, let me invite in and, um, and then I think I will briefly introduce him and then we're gonna have little, just a surprise uh, conversation in a, in a minute. Um, so there was a revised, um, so here we are. Uh, if you're looking at my screens, uh, here is the surprise guest we have. Um, Dr. Kim Jung-gi, or he liked to call Jung, uh, yeah, Kim Jung-gi or Jung-gi Kim, as you know, the East Asian order of name surname comes first and, um, and um, a given name comes after. Um, he's a very good friend of mine, or rather senior, and he's actually chief curator of National Museum of Modern Art and Contemporary Art Korea, the most important organizations establishment, MMCA. Um, but we were both our uh, comrade or colleague in the Minjung art movement. He was actually someone who was ahead of me and our junior um, as, a, as a, a young university student. So um, uh, Jung-gi uh, is here apparently, can, and he doesn't necessarily speak English. So I just want to say, um, invite him to just say hi first, and then he will wait for his turn uh, after presentation of Abanet. Jungi, uh, can you, Jungi Sanseim, uh, just uh, say hello, I will, and I will translate him. And then, um, um, and then I will ask the question to Kim Jungi actually, and I'll see how he answers, okay? <laughs> so, uh, Kim Jungi Sanseim, 지금 Tina가 발표를 했는데, 혹시 슬라이드 좀 보셨나요? 네, 계속 봤습니다. 네, 네. Uh, I saw the slide. Yeah. So I asked question whether he saw the slides. Um, the, so the question is um, whether um, the the how those images that uh, Tina showing, including uh, Kim, you know Oyun and uh, Ichersu, how do those are archived and uh, and shown to the uh, to the public? How it is exhibited in Korea? Uh, what's the culture? Because it's a very rich part of history. This is English, okay? And then I will uh, translate in Korean. Uh, 지금 질문이 뭐였냐면요. 그, 이, 저기 오윤 그림이랑 뭐 이처럼 막 이렇게 민중 아트 그림들이 있잖아요. 그것들이 굉장히 중요한 그 한국에 당연히 있다 보니까 역사임이 틀림없는데 어, 이 그림들이 어떻게 어, 이렇게 아카이브가 되어 있고 어떤 방식으로 아카이브가 되고 그 당시에 굉장히 검열과 탄압을 많이 받았는데 그리고 지금 그게 한국의 미술계에서 어떤 방식으로 exhibition, uh, 전시가 되고 있는지. 그래서 티나가 지금 얘기한 게, 아, 자기는, 에, 유, 어, 오윤 그림책, 그, 파블리싱이 너무 잘된게 있어가지고, 그거를 구했다, 인, 온라인에서. 그렇게 대답을 했고, 여기에 대해서 김정희 선생님이 혹시, 어, 아카이빙 뭐 이런 부분, 우리가 참 잘하긴 했죠. 예, 대답해 주실 게 있, 있으신가요? 어, 이, 1994년에 민중미술 15년 전이라고 하는 전시가 MMCA에서 열렸습니다. 그러니까 국가가 공식적으로 민중 아트에 대해서 국가기구에서 대대적인 전시를 연 거죠. 
1980년부터 87년까지 어, 매우 매우 격렬한 어, 민주화 운동이 있었고 그 결과 1992년에 어, 민주 정부가 들어섰습니다. 그래서 94년에 민중 아트 전시가 열렸고 그 이후에 에, 보다 체계적인 어, 미술관 컬렉션이 이루어졌고 어, 관련된 자료들도 어, 또 연구도 어, 그 성과가 체계적으로 이루어지고 있는 거죠. 지금까지 그 분위기가 이어지고 있습니다. 오케이, 제이미, would you like to thank you very much? 정말 대답 감사합니다. 제이미, would you like to try translating? Yeah. Um, in 1994, Minjung Art 15 Years um, exhibition was opened in at the Modern Museum of Korean, uh, Modern Museum of Contemporary Art in South Korea. And it shows that government finally acknowledged the Minjung art within the country. In 1992, democratic government came into power And after that, more systemic art collection and research process is continuing to go on. And this kind of um, uh, thought is continu it's continuing its legacy to this day. Yeah. I think very clean, all good uh, translation. Uh, 선생님, 쉬세요. 네. <웃음> 네. 어, 조금 더 기다려 주십시오. 그럼 이제 민중 아트 세션은 끝나는 건가요? 어, 아니요. 어, 민중 아트 그다음에 인도 농민 운동 그거 끝나고 나서 선생님 그 인터뷰할 예정이었거든요. 괜찮으세요? 네, 알겠습니다. 네, 30분 이후에요. 예. 자, 티나. 오케이. So um so any questions please uh, to Tina and anything we can support uh, there are so many experts also who can support as well any other questions please very good question by the way we have question from Tim Cho yep Tim please go ahead uh, first of all thank you so much Tina and um, because um, they were like uh, just upon looking at Minjung art it's very uh, emotional and there's a lot of heaviness to it. And I can almost see the lineage of um, uh, uh, the uh, spirit of uh, laborers and the working people's um, protests and um, push for a better treatment. Um, I, it's like almost like seeing like a lineage of that, um, seeing the art. Um, I was just wondering, maybe even Soyang can show Soyang could, um, answer this um, because um, you've experienced it firsthand. Um, I'm guessing it um, the woodblock prints. I'm sure it was kind. Of, it seems like we Korea already had all the technology to be able to print. Um, I, I'm guessing the woodblock prints were um, adopted in because um, it's heavily censored. Um, how are these? Um, so, so what, was it like a um, trending or like a popular um, style to kind of resort to wood blocks? Like, was that the most convenient or it, did it have like a significant meaning um, seeing that I could see um, it, like almost like continuation of it um, through that, throughout the whole presentation um, of the medium? So I was just curious about the medium itself. I wonder the point of question is whether you see a particular um, style trend yourself. You see that among the woodblock prints? Uh, yeah, that too. But the, just the technology and then the, um, I guess, the practice itself of using woodblock prints. Mm -hmm. um, um, is that, uh, does that have, to, does that reflect um, the censorship, first of all, because obviously printing was available? And also, um, does it also kind of significant? Was the what bot prints, the process of it significant to the I don't know the spirit or the culture of Minjung art? Yeah, well, I uh, have uh, my responses, but it's a Tina's presentation, so Tina can perhaps uh, can share your uh, observation based on your research, and then I will maybe support and sure. add. 
Yeah, so I think it was less about convenience and more about like uniquely Asian, like Korean aesthetics. Because previously, like I talked uh, briefly about um, Korean monochrome. And while it was like the aesthetics were pretty Korean, I would say, they weren't really like it was very, they were more concerned with like formalism rather than like activism. So I think the wood plot wood wood block aesthetic was just Minjung arts artists trying to like look within their own context and their own like identity, like trying to form an identity around their unique like aesthetics. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's actually one uh, one way of um, uh, also answering. And I also can add something uh, there. In fact. Um, uh, interestingly speaking, Minjung art uh, movement inspired by, um, you know, restoring Korean aesthetics, but to be able to come up with a communicative aesthetic with the people to reconnect the art with the people rather than um, um, become something that is only understood in elitist realm because they want to make a contribution to the democ democracy, democratization movement of the society. And so they found that uh, woodblock, of course, as uh, Tim just noted, as we instinctively feel, it's a very austere and simple and something very physical about woodblock instead of mm -hmm. the, even other um, print medium. Of course, print medium is always uh, preferred in the context of uh, social reform mo movement, the social protest movement from 90s and uh, 90s, uh, 90s 1930s, uh, if you remember those uh, radical moments in, in Europe, um, and without um, any hesitation, we see that emergence of print medium because it uh, can be mass produced. So encountering the, uh, the power of dissemination of the, those in power, um, artists and those who are interested in using different medium of mass producing their messages, and the print was basically come in handy. But why would black print was so loved by Korean artists in 1980s? I think it's there is an aesthetic of labor there, the roughness, mm -hmm. and which I think Tina captured as a, as a, as a aesthetic of Koreans, but at the same time, it's an aesthetic of people, people who doesn't have much means. And also it is like something of a hardship that the quality of, of the tactile aesthetic that uh, Woodblock um, um, uh, evoke, uh, I think will contribute to the, to the choice, but at the same time, it also pay homage to the Chinese actually revolutionary print movement as well, interestingly in 1930s. Uh, so a combination of all these three uh, made this particular style very uh, popular is my uh, uh, in interpretation. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a really, uh, that was a great, really great answer. Um, um, I, I couldn't really imagine that not knowing the history, but seeing that tied in with adding folklore like Kyonu and Chingnyo mm -hmm. and things like that, um, I can see now um, putting myself back into um, the shoes of the um, people back then, what would be relevant and what would speak to me. Um, it's a really, really um, great conversation. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. And I can see a question from um, a hyper question, Mel, uh, Mr. Mel Beck and Belek, please go ahead. Yes, uh, but you more or less started answering my question. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, of course, there was this art which was rooted in Korean aesthetic, but there was also the political side of this art. And there were uh, political arts art forms which were available in Korea and in the countries surrounding Korea. There was, of course, a modern woodcut movement in China. There was a red painting in Japan. There had been a communist painting in the 20s. And there had been uh, a contest art in the end of the 40s and the beginning of the 50s. And in Korea itself, there was a communist art in the 20s too, even though it, there's not, not much left of it. And there was, of course, a red painting from Northern Korea. So I was wondering how the Minjong artist try, did they try to connect what they did with all these other political art and how did they try to do it? Wow, that was actually very expert 
uh, questions. Uh, Tina, can you be able to answer, is it within the scope of your research? Um, I feel like I'm not <laughs> um, equipped to answer such a deep question. Um, so, so maybe you can you can go ahead and answer that. Yeah, I can actually support that uh, part of the conversation. So, um, so in fact, what is interesting is that uh, Minjung artists try to create uh, new types of um, uh, socially inspired um, transnational um, aesthetic connections with um, arts, artists and art movement from all around the world, while the elite, uh, the dominant, uh, the establishment of Korean artists, such as let's say represented by Morokum, were particularly interested in aligning themselves with um, aesthetic model that is popular in, let's say, um, um, the Western metropolis uh, establishment or within uh, United States or the elite circle of, of, of Europe. So, um, so what is interesting is that, that uh, the inspiration does for Minjung artists in 1980s coming from, not from, let's say, the um, synchronous um, 1980s uh, political movement or political art from elsewhere, but they actually um, study even Mexican muralism, uh, if you are aware of it, um, the Diego Rivera, Orozc, 1930s because it was one of the most celebrated form of, 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 of people's art. And it also the Mexican aesthetic does appear to Korean aesthetic quite a bit because it's very earthy and very humanistic. So it is, and they actually um, um, voraciously uh, study uh, those aesthetics, especially uh, Oyun's uh, case and many others while they are also studying the Buddhist art Tenghua um, to adopt and uh, repurposing the aesthetic, which is already familiar among populations to turn it into a certain you know, means of um, a social commentary, new types of Korean aesthetic in conversation with um, you know, familiar aesthetics of people as well as those which has a political edge. But it should appear to the the general public is the in fact quite important principle. There were some Minjung artists who were practicing very um, socialist realism inspired type of art, very kind of romantic, heavily uh, socialist um, figurative art, which was quite um, it was. Um, practiced, but it wasn't necessarily popular among uh, Korean, uh, uh, among uh, protest community. But who were favored was like Oyun's aesthetic or Imok Sang's aesthetic and all that who actually have quite a vernacular um, sentiments uh, incorporated into their new subject matters and uh, the way they adopt even um, the wood blocks or uh, traditional Asian paintings, or even when they use oil, it's just to convey certain different Korean adaptations of it. So, um, and Imok San is a very important artist in that context. Does it answer your question, uh, Mr. Bell? It Bell's? does. <laughs> it would bring another question, but uh, I guess we don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much for uh, the question that probably interesting question. And there is a one more question. I know it's getting a little extended. I think a core value of Minjung art, uh, is there any just moment? Who is the, uh, Min, Mina, Mina, Maria Kim? Uh, Maria, can you just speak out? Or it's, if Han is the emotion of unreserved the sentiment, I'm reading it for Tina. Trauma regarding injustice, revenge, how has it been passed down to current generations? What are some ways to bring healing and resolution to these deeply rooted emotions? If any, how can these generations, our generation, I'm part of, respect, respectively facilitate these processes? So it is a question of trauma and Han, how it is, has a currency in relation to contemporary current uh, Korean population is another <laughs> heavy question. I don't know whether Tina can answer, 
but then I can go, uh, go ahead. And then second case, I will bundle it together. I think the core value of Minjung art is art for people. Now the Minjung art has contributed to democracy for people. What is the new mission for the current era? Two questions. Um, yeah, so I can just kind of scratch the surface for the first question. I think acknowledgement and kind of like, yeah, acknowledgement is important. And I think um, trying to like avoid the like the Asian amnesia, like trying to forget and not really like reconciling with the past. I think to avoid that, yeah, acknowledgement is important and to to be knowledgeable and to to just come to terms and like accept the past in order to confront uh, the present or the future. Yeah. Um, if there's anything you can add to that. So, um, yeah. I think that's very good uh, answer for the, the, to the first one. Yes, so expose of, uh, you know, what is made in force to be invisible, made visible is one of important contribution. Yes, this artists have done is very important because again, if it is invisible, you can't fight uh, against it. And so, and so trauma is of course, if you're questioning about the intergenerational things, um, Korean democratization means that democratization processes itself has been dealing with step by step this um, unresolved the traumas from the beginning of 20th century. So those know um, you need to study Korean histories really. It's how the unresolved grievance turned into Han and how 1980s art, mo uh, art social movement was the first step to actively intervene into the unresolved, historically accumulated traumas and wound. So if you study uh, post-1993 Korean politics, especially when the democratic government have, um, uh, you know, hold on um, power, they, you will notice that systematically continue the processes of addressing, redeem the people who are wrongly accused of communists, people who are wrongly taken off their properties, people who are wrongly by previous regime and things, they're going step by step in Korean society, Korea as a country is a continu continuing that uh, processes until today. And it's a huge subject and I'm one of the scholar on that, meaning rectification of history is something to address wound and trauma, which has not been resolved. So that's the one thing I can add. Um, a lot of my publication is about that. Oh, somebody's a voice? Yeah, it's me. I was just, these are really great conversations and I, I really like it, but I think we should move on to the next presenter. I know. So yeah, those other comments we can actually uh, deal with next uh, uh, round also. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, um, Tina. That was, it really enriched our conversation. Abunet, are you ready for the... Yeah. Thank um, you. So Abhinit, I'll just yeah, go ahead. Can I go ahead? Okay. Host, are you a host? Yes, great. Yeah. So Abhinit is our next speaker um, and who's going to be talking about archiving protest, imagining community, a uh, reading of the trolley times, which dealing with directly what is going on right now in India. Uh, thank you, Soyang, for that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is Evneet Dollywall, and I'll be talking to you about a publication that I've been researching called The Trolley Times. Um, it's a grassroots publication that emerged in response to the farmers' protest that's been happening in India for the past six months now. So I'll be focusing on the archival aspect of The Trolley Times, and I'll be considering its role in supporting the ongoing mobilization of the protesters, but also in strengthening the sense of solidarity that exists within this community of protesters. Um, so some quick background. In September 2020, three agriculture laws were passed by the Indian government in what's been referred to as a, quote, blatantly undemocratic, end quote, fashion. Um, so in a nutshell, these laws aim to further corporatize the agriculture sector and farmers across the country believe that these laws will lead to the loss of their lands and livelihoods. So in November 2020, farmers who had already been protesting these laws in the states of Punjab and Haryana um, decided to move their local protests to the nation's capital, Delhi. 
um, and then joined by farmers from other states in India. They've been camped out at the borders of Delhi for six months now, and they're prepared to continue living there indefinitely or as long as it takes to have these laws repealed. So here you can see a farmer sitting in a trolley, which is the sort of trailer that attaches to the backs of tractors. And you can see that he's draped this tarp over his trolley and turned it into a sort of makeshift caravan. So by December 2020, over 95,000 trolleys had lined the borders of Delhi as farmers assembled to protest these laws. So this photograph was actually the starting point of my research into the farmers' protest. Um, I remember being really struck by the image because the holes in the tarp kind of look like stars. And the same image is printed in the first edition of the Trolley Times. Uh, so as support for the farmers protest grew, government affiliated media outlets continued to vilify the farmers, calling them separatists and terrorists and that sort of thing. And so a group of artists, writers and activists started the Trolley Times to share stories from the farmers protest. It's a weekly publication in the form of a newspaper and copies of each edition are distributed uh, to protesters at the borders and they're also uploaded to their website. So printed in the deep blue ink of the Trolley Times, I think this photograph looks even more like an image of a man sitting under a sky full of stars. Um, and there's this sort of tension between two kinds of spaces. Uh, you have the confinement of the trolley, but also this open endless sky. And it's an image that speaks to the harsh realities of leaving home to live at a protest site but also evokes a sense of hope and freedom. Um, and this act of recording moments from the farmers protest, but also sustaining and supporting the morale of the protesters is I believe a defining function of the Trolley Times. So each edition of the Trolley Times after the first one features an illustration on the front page. Uh, these illustrations are based on photographs from the farmers protest and they're usually of protesters engaged in various activities at the protest. So the first page includes updates on the protest and information about the direction that it's taking. And then the remaining pages include artwork and photographs and poetry. Uh, there are articles by academics and economists, but there are also personal essays and anecdotes from the protesters and their allies. So one edition includes excerpts from an article that was originally published in the Washington Post. Um, so the team behind this publication aren't necessarily producing content, but gathering it from this community of protesters and their allies, and then collecting it all in one place. Uh, in this way, the publication functions as a sort of community archive. And this archival aspect of the Trolley Times um, takes on greater significance when we consider what archives are. So archives, as you know, are collections of materials that document or represent history, um, but they're also deeply entangled in notions of identity and community. So Elizabeth Yale, who is a scholar who's written about the history of archives, states that archives are where we go to establish ownership, to clear our names, to tell ourselves who we are as nations, churches, political parties, families, and individuals. So what she's pointing out is that archives are not only about remembering the past, but also about turning to the past to define and understand who we are today. And if you wanna take that one step further, archives are also about how we envision the future. So Michelle Caswell builds on this idea of um, the remembered past influencing what we imagine as being possible for the future. And she uses the, ter the term archival imaginary to point out that archival interventions into representations of the past can allow us to re-envision ways of moving forward and also what's possible in the future. So with the Trolley Times then, I understand um, these illustrations as being these sort of interventions into representations of the past, um, in this case, the recent past. Uh, this places the Trolley Times in a unique position because it's a publication that's archiving an ongoing protest from within that protest, and it's doing so for people who are going to be impacted by this archival imaginary that's formed by these collected texts and images. 
Um, so this means that it's important to consider not only what we choose to remember, but also how we choose to remember it. Um, so trigger warning, the next slide includes an image of a wounded protester, and I talk about police brutality. Um, nothing insanely graphic, but I thought I'd give you a heads up. So edition nine of the Trolley Times includes an illustration of a protester moments after his experience of police violence. Um, the illustration is based on this photograph, and in my paper, I point out the intentionality with which this event has been archived and the sort of archival interventions that have been made into this represented moment. So there's a line of sideways text that reads, not every wounded head bows, and it starts at the bottom of the page and guides the reader's gaze to the protester's face. Um, and he has his mouth open wide to reveal a full set of teeth as if he's roaring into the distance um, and he's raising his arm into the air. And what I find interesting is that in the photograph, which is also included in the Trolley Times as well, we can't see his fist. Um, but in the illustration, they've made sure to include it. And they've even added these subtle motion lines to really emphasize the force of his gesture. So overall, it's an image of defiance and resilience and a sort of call to action to keep going with the protest. Um, so Anne Rigney has discussed how violence against protesters is remembered. And she points out that we often remember these moments of violence in terms of trauma and that this actually focuses attention on the negativity of the event and feelings of victimhood. And it overshadows the quote, visibility of alternative history, including the history of nonviolent struggle and other collective expressions of hope and the possibility of achieving justice, end quote. Um, so Rigney suggests outrage as an alternative framework for remembering violence against protesters because outrage um, it doesn't focus on these feelings of victimhood, but inspires a sense of righteous indignation. Um, so this illustration here is very much so an image of outrage. And so when the protesters um, read the Trolley Times and encounter this recorded event, they can envision a future in which their continued collective efforts lead to an ultimate victory as opposed to further pain and disheartenment. So that's one of the ways in which these illustrations act as these sort of archival interventions. Um, but when I was looking through these publications, I kept feeling like there was something more that was happening. And I was so moved by the illustrations and I had the sense that there was another significance to them that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Um, so I've been trying to answer this question of what meaning do these illustrations hold? And two terms come to mind when I um, think about the illustrations and how they represent this community of protesters. Uh, so these terms are imagined community and apne, which is a Punjabi word. So Benedict Anderson uses the term imagined community to talk about the origins of nationalism. And he says that all nations are imagined because members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members, meet them or even hear of them. Yet in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. So you might not meet everyone in a nation, but you know that they're out there. Um, so in the Trolley Times, the imagined community of the protesters is reinforced by the photographs of the protesters. Um, so these images here on the screen right now are printed in edition five of the Trolley Times, and they show demonstrations that have been led by members of the Indian diaspora in various countries around the world um, in support of the farmers' protest. So by archiving these images in the Trolley Times, the publication is reinforcing the imagined community of the protesters as a transnational one. Similarly, uh, when protesters at one protest site see images of people at the other protest sites, they can look beyond their immediate circumstances and find strength in knowing that there are others out there who are also working to have these laws repealed. Um, and this is especially important because many of the protesters at the farmers protest are elderly people. Um, so they're either unfamiliar with social media or they simply don't have access to it. Uh, in terms of the illustrations, then, I've been using the term apne to understand their si significance. Um, so apne is a Punjabi word, and it means ours. 
uh, the singular forms of the word apna and apni mean one of ours. Uh, these words are often used to recognize that someone shares um, the same cultural background or community as you do. And I've been thinking about all the times that I've noticed people who are essentially strangers um, looking at me sort of speculatively and one person will turn to the other and ask, e apnia? is she one of ours? And I specifically remember a Punjabi customer from when I worked in retail um, and she was trying so hard to find a pair of shoes that she could buy just so that I could make commission. And when her husband came in and asked why she didn't just go to another store, she sort of gestured in my direction and said, e apnea. she is one of ours. So the term apne is about this encounter with members of your own community, but it also speaks to this compulsion to take responsibility for the well-being of someone who is one of your own. You know, so why did she take it upon herself to personally make sure that I made commission that day? And why do I feel so personally invested in this farmer's protest, which is happening in a country I've only visited twice. Um, so although these illustrations represent members of this imagined community of protesters, unlike the photographs, they do not immediately come across as specific identifiable people. Um, instead, as these minimal drawings made up of only the essential lines, these illustrated figures become immediately recognized simply as fellow protesters. Um, they become apne or one of ours. And by evoking this notion of apne, the illustrations become this way of archiving the sense of solidarity and connection that comes with apne and that exists among the members of this imagined community. And so in the context of the farmers protest, um, this is significant because the community that has formed at the protest sites is unified, but also very diverse. Um, everyone is here to have the laws repealed, but through this protest, other issues have come to the surface. So women are gathering and speaking out about their own overlooked role as farmers. Um, farm laborers are engaging in discussions with farmers about their own difficulties um, with low wages and that sort of thing. Um, and people of certain castes are speaking out against caste discrimination and pointing out that their caste makes them vulnerable to police violence and that sort of thing in a way that's different um, from other protesters. And so you have this community that maintains solidarity while also recognizing intersectionality. And by archiving the stories of this diverse community within the framework of APNE, the Trolley Times allows readers to envision a future built on solidarity and social justice. Um, and I think the archival imaginary of the Trolley Times can be best summed up in this quote from the publication itself, in which a protester noted that the farmers protest is an inspiration for India's future, where people from different ideologies and backgrounds can come together and work for the collective benefit of all. Um, so I will leave you, whoops, with uh, this slide, which has the Trolley Times website and their Instagram page, in case you want to go and um, look at the publication in more detail, which I encourage you to do. Okay, so I'm gonna end that and stop sharing. Okay. I can't hear you. I'm muted. I'm that muted. was a powerful presentation, uh, Abnet. Um, wow. Um, so let me just, um, yeah. Uh, so many questions, uh, hands up, and so let's, yeah, just go ahead. Yes, uh, Jinyoung, please go ahead. Hi, Abnit. Thank you so Hi. much for the presentation. It's great. Um, I learned, and it's just beautiful the way uh, the publication is being made. And I imagine that it's be circulated in paper in the form of print, printed mm -hmm. uh, matter. Uh, I was wondering about the significance of the blue ink. It seems that they are um, this like monochrome blue aesthetic. Um, it's uh, it's very uh, evocative in many levels. On on one hand, that it makes me think about um, uh, some kind of blueprint of uh, original like sort of prints or original structure. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to know more about why they uh, utilize blue as a color for their 
Um, yeah. Simple. Um, that's such a good question. And as far as I know, there's no specific like symbolic reason or anything for using blue. Um, I think it's monochrome because um, that's efficient and cost effective. And the blue, I guess, is more visually interesting than just a black and white newspaper. Um, so if I were to guess at why they chose um, blue, I think it would just, like you said, to create the sort of um, identifiable aesthetic that people can recognize that, oh, that's the trolley times. Um, but other than that, there's no like specific reason for choosing blue. Um, it's a, it's a st interesting choice of color. I, have to say. I totally it's agree. A, the, it's very calming. It has a very calming effect. Mm -hmm. while we That's see true. It, um, rather than having this sort of like, uh, uh, um, typical identification with activism being so aggressive and, yeah. um, you know, uh, uh, aggressive. So yeah, yeah I've. Yeah, thank you. So oh, that's such an interesting <laughs> observation because um, that's mm -hmm. something that hadn't even crossed my mind. But now that you've brought it up, um, I think, especially with the calming effect, as opposed to like the rigor of activism, um, this publication is meant primarily for the protesters themselves um, so that they can see their own stories reflected back at them, um, especially because there's so much uh, media vilification and so it makes sense uh, for them to use a color that wouldn't be so like intense and in your face um, because these people are already, you know, dealing with so much at these protest sites. So yeah, thank you for that. I just wanna echo also, uh, unless there's uh, somebody else hand, has hands or I can't see any hands. Can I just go ahead? Yeah, comments. So I think that echoes that question on the color and overall tone is very um, inviting than intimidating or overly heavy handed. Um, yeah. um, and you mentioned also um, about the, you find that illustration so endearing or you use the different terms um, and that you couldn't quite put your finger on why you like it so much. And I kind of completely connected to that feeling because I also noticed that the on over monochrome tone mm -hmm. and also the illustration being, it is sort of aesthetic actually, it's a people's aesthetic, interestingly, yeah. that in fact, we just were having this conversation in relation to 1980s in South Korea. Um, that is actually, uh, I feel like love uh, of community in that, in terms of sentiment, it's not protest, but it's like love and community let's be together until the end yeah we're not going home let's mm -hmm. let's be connected so that kind of sentiment is conveyed through interestingly the layout and design and whoever does this um design this alternative media right uh, mm -hmm. to counter the lack of coverages of course there must be a lot of censorship going on in in indian uh, context right now and so i think those all interestingly contributed to that and I also want to comment on, you know, the, your um, um, discussion on how not only the law uh, issue, the, the uh, law has been like um, uh, so marginalizing the farmers, etc. But while these um, people are out there to protest that issues, at the same time enacted a lot of other issues of injustice and voices caste system, women's rights, and everything kind of come in. So I have witnessed exactly the same uh, types of, of uh, community of, of protest voices uh, emerges like in the 1980s and that legacy carries on in, in Korea. Mm -hmm. So not could not be dealt with that directly in the 80s, but one by one, all the voices which emerged at the time dealt by different groups and different uh, emergent groups deal with it mm -hmm. in the long span of time. And so I'm just uh, have a goosebump whenever I hear, I heard a little bit of teaser of your presentation before, but how history repeats. I'm just um, uh, satirizing this expression is not used that way, but it's like um, there is a great connectivity in humanities and how we protest and how we feel, how we try to get through this moment, right? And also, 
I just can see the happiness is through these trolley times, yeah. being connected, and finally they're making voices that never heard and uh, etc. So, anyways, yeah, no, I think that's um, like great observations, and I think that's also reflected in uh, the stories that are in the trolley times. Um, so, not all of them are related to the uh, um, protest, uh, like the major events necessarily, but like smaller little interactions between individual protesters are also um, archived. So wonderful. We can go on talking another hour. However, is there any like comment quickly? Um, otherwise, very powerful form that promotes active care and investing in community building. Yes, aesthetic of additions are gentle and gives. Yes, I think we covered this one. This was a comment when I'm stunned uh, at the free flowing illustrations that seems to bleed into the text. That, that is such an yes effectiveness in expressing emotion here. All right, good observation. I see an alignment, alignment between this way of depicting these um, scenes and community and the definition of archive. Uh, thank you for sharing this. I feel um, an agreeable collaboration between art and text. Yes, wow, great observation. Um, one more comment is coming from Jung Yun Park. Um, thank you for sharing this presentation of NET. It is really interesting to see truly times after we talked about Min Jung art, which wasn't able to display it in a mass media by the government at the time. Now, the fact that we see such a mediums become place that supports activism and political movement is inspiring. Great uh, comments. Well, thank you very much. Um, Avne, I really wish to go on, but I think we okay. also uh, yeah. <laughs> have, um, uh, we are, I think, extending 30 more minutes in, in relation to, in addition to our, um, the original plan, because we have a two events left. Uh, one surprise event, because my guest Kim Jung-gi has been waking up in Korea at 5 a.m. to say hello to the event. So um, uh, it will be, um, uh, I think, a shame to just uh, waste his efforts. Uh, so, Avonet, thanks a lot, and uh, and uh, and please, yes. Um, so um, let me just uh, quickly introduce um, just to. Okay, I think I I think this. So. Um, so this will be a translation of uh, my surprise guest because he is the one of the biggest figure in Korea in all parts in Asia in terms of representation of art and protests. And um, he, uh, Min Jung Arts, um, which lasted for 10 years, by the way, in Korea, participated by, by, by more than 200 artists, which is unprecedented in actually in global history. And Kim Jung Gi is one of the second generation curator um, who actually organized protest art movement and undone the solidarity movement in the villages and um, it's he has the 20 years or 30 years of commitment to this um, um, uh, this um, art for social change so he is the one of the biggest figure in Korea when it comes to this subject and it happened to be my senior and direct and mentor and inspiration for me and so, and then at the same time, he has been the uh, curator of many different cities um, uh, uh, movement, uh, cities of uh, 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 museums, uh, Busan City Museum, Jeju City Museum, Daejeon City Museum. He was a chief curator of those important establishment. So he's a someone who switched between the, um, the street the uh, place of alternative art movement and also establishment. So we're gonna have that question to him as well. Jamie, are you translating this to Kim Jung Gi? Hmm. Yeah, you should be uh, simultaneous translating that too. Yeah. So, um, so today the forum that we're going to have a brief in invitations and it's going to be 10 minutes conversations on um, and uh, he wanna just support that uh, we are discussing the Minjung arts and also trolley times, uh, very important uh, um, um, uh, gestures uh, by the artists and uh, artist communities. So now, uh, Kim Jung-hee 선생님, 안녕하세요. 저희 안녕하세요. 안녕하세요. 
또 제이미 유 아이 트랜슬레이팅 라이 이트 소 우리가 너무 딜레이가 돼 가지고 어, 한 15분 정도 짧게 문답 정도 에, 하는 걸로 하겠습니다. 어, 김준규 선생님 제가 이제 양적 설명을 드렸고요. 에, 어, 첫 질문은 민중 미술의 그 가담하게 참여하게 된 계기가 어, 88년 어, 학번이시죠. You entered the university in 1988. Um, 뭐였는지요? So my translation for uh, English audience, speaking audience is that what was the motive that you uh, participated in Minjung art movements? Uh, you entered the university in 1988, which is later half of the, the, the 10 years of, of rise of Minjung arts, which roughly started from 1979. So what motivated you to be part of Minjung arts movement? 제가 민중 미술의 그 당사자라고 하기보다는 2세대면 1990년대에 벌어진 그 이후에 민중 미술 2세대 작가들과 함께 민중 미술의 패러다임 전환, 패러다임 쉬프트를 위해서 큐레이터로서 연구자로서 어, 함께 왔고 그런 맥락에서 저는 조금 있다가 저에게 한 10분 정도 시간을 주신다면 어, 민중미술 이후에 소셜 아트에 대해서 좀 소개할 수 있는 시간을 가졌으면 좋겠습니다. 그거는 다음에 um, 진짜 아, 아 please go ahead, Jane. Uh, uh, he said that I worked more closely with second gen Minjing art artists, and I helped create paradigm shift within Minjing art as a curator and researcher. That's very, very uh, actually simple and neat translation. I think Kim Jung Kim, you could have made a chimian grown chimun margo, shilter, or cogo de so 어 uh, 저는 저희는 괜찮습니다. 왜냐하면 지금 주제가 맞아 떨어져서 well we're gonna then skip the all those small questions as if you know it's an interview form that we always had a slow to interview professional but he wanna actually speak about how um Minjung art has uh take different turns um after uh, 1995 94 and what is his environment he has even slide presentation on this in addition to the presentation what are we going to do you hear me come on sorry i'm going to leave me down there 네, 드립니다. 아, 그러면 김중현 선생님 주제가 뭐라고 얘기를 하면 될까요? 우리 we, we should give him the uh, host status. So, uh, 김중기 is a co-host now. Host 되셨으니까 이제 파일세요 하실 하실 수 있거든요, 선생님. 예, 네. 네. 그 어, 여기서 저는 두 가지 터미널로지를 어, 제시하고 싶은데 민중 미술을 흔히들 어, 폴리티컬 아트라고 얘기합니다. 어, 그것은 이제 1980년대라고 하는 어, 민주화 운동의 시기에 발생한 것이 민중화트이기 때문에 그런데 이제 민주주의가 일정 정도 성립되고 나서 그 이후에 어 지속적으로 폴리티컬 아트가 이어지기에는 동력이 떨어졌던 거죠. 그래서 어 민중 미술가들 또는 이제 진보적인 예술 활동을 하는 사람들은 정치의 장으로부터 사회의 장으로 폴리티컬 아트로부터 소셜 아트로 패러다임 시프트를 했던 것이죠. 그래서 저는 그 대목에 대해서 어 조금 언급해 드리는 것이 민중 미술 이후에 한국의 예술의 흐름에 대해서 이해하는 데 중요한 포인트가 될 거라고 생각해서 그 말씀을 조금 드려 보고자 합니다. Um, so he's going to be speaking on two terms. In the beginning, Minjung art was considered a political art. This is because Minjung art led the 80s democratization movement. But once democracy became stable in South Korea, political art no longer had its momentum. So Minjung art changed its head towards social art. 
어, 왜냐하면 민중미술이 끝나고 나서도 민중미술의 당사자들은 지금까지도 왕성하게 현장에 왕성하게 현역 작가로 한국 미술계의 중요한 아티스트로 활동을 하고 있어요. 그래서 그 사람들이 80년대 이후에 어떻게 전환해 왔는지에 대해서 주목해 볼 필요가 있다고 생각합니다. Um, Minjung artists continue to grow and act as important figures in Korean art society, and it is important to note and understand what they are doing after the democratization and how they grew to be, uh, how they fit in with society as the time moves on. 여전히 한국은 분단 국가죠. 그래서 분단을 극복하고 평화를 이루는 것이 한국 미술가들의 아주 중요한 과제로 남아 있습니다. Korea is still split between two countries, and it is a big concern of artists to con um, figure out how to mend this separation between the two countries. 에, 그러니까 여러분들이 생각하기에 한국은 어, 경제적으로 번영을 이루고 뭐, 코로나도 잘 커버하고 있고 이렇게 보이지만 한국 사회의 근본적으로 깔려 있는 트라우마는 여전히 분단 국가라고 하는 그 분단으로부터 나오는 이념적인 어, 편향성 장애 이런 것들이 여전히 존재하거든요. 그런 것들을 어떻게 넘어설 것인가가 예술가들에게 예술가뿐만 아니고 어, 한국 사람들 모두에게 아주 중요한 문제입니다. 아까 박 교수님이 한이라고 말씀하신 그 대목은 근본적으로 20세기에 하는 식민지와 분단 이두 가지로부터 나오는 것이죠. Um, Korea on the facade is wealthy and prosperous, as you can see in many different examples, such as how well Korea fought off COVID in the recent example. Um, Korea's trauma comes from separation and how to overcome this um, separation and distance is the prime, pro uh, prime problem of artists and people in Korea to tackle. And Han, as Soyang has mentioned, comes from this um, trauma of separation. Uh, two things. Just Not two only things. national division, but also <laughs> colonization. <laughs> oh, and colonization. Right. No, you understood. <laughs> okay, he understands English, all right. So the Han comes from, trauma comes from, basically he um, uh, the make it to concept. Colonization, experience of colonial, being colonized once and continue to deal with the legacy and also division of country is a still remaining issues in Korea. And then uh, the current artists who are you know, interested in dealing with trauma in Han is continue to tackle that issues and the legacy of it. Yep. So, uh, political art, after 어, 사회적 의제들을 다루는 소셜 아트로 전환해 왔다. 그리고 21세기에 그런 소셜 아트의 흐름들이 나타나고 있다는 것을 강조하고 싶습니다. Um, so political from political art it changed towards social art and in 21st century um, social art is the new paradigm for Minjung art and that's what the artists are now focusing on. 어 김준규 선생님 저희 네. 제 생각에는 오늘은 티저 그러니까 맛배기만 해야 되니까 혹시 네. 네, 이거를 너무 주제를 깊이 들어가시면 다음에 음, 그래요 네. 네 왜냐하면 근데 방금 말씀하신 게 대답이 됐어요 학생 중에 하나가 질문이 그게 있었거든요 근데 우리 음, 음, 오케이 음. 자 그러면 박저 네. 예정된 질문이 몇개 있었죠 그것에 대해서 네. 빠르게 질문 주시고 답하는 걸로 하죠 네 그렇게 하겠습니다. So yeah, because he entering into a very important territory that in partially answered question uh, to one of questions, we, we didn't answer and moved on to the next speaker. So I asked him to give a presentation on them properly in the future in the, because today was just a teaser of, of his activities. And so the, I gave the questions because it's meant to be interview style. And uh, so my question, second question I have had was, what was your most memorable uh, activist arts uh, related, um, um, yeah, activist, uh, activist and arts um, um, practices? Uh, he has a numerous involvement in different events and, and issues. And so, Kajang uh, Kiyogi Namne Hengdong Jue Misul, Hopshi Kwalian Deshin Got the Hanguges or Otongi Kiyong Nashin Kajang. 
어, 80년대가 아닌 21세기 2003년도부터 벌어진 대추리에서 벌어진 어, 미군기지 확장 어, 미군기지 확장에 대해서 저항하는 1천명 1천명의 아티스트들이 함께 어, 그 미군기지 확장을 반대하는 대추리라고 하는 작은 마을에서 벌어진 어, 평화예술운동 네. 그 장에 참가해서 아트, 아티스트들과 함께 활동하고 또 아카이브 그, 그것을, 그것에 대해서 기록하고 어, 했던 것이 저로서는 가장 큰 기억에 남습니다. 지금 캠프 험프리스라고 하는 미국 이외에 미국 바깥에 존재하는 가장 큰 미군기지가 한국에 있습니다. 지어, 새로 지어졌습니다. 그 미군기지는 사실은 동북아시아에서 중국을 견제하는 가장 강력한 베이스 캠프가 되어 있고 어, 그것을 어, 만드는 과정에서 어, 벨리지 피플 마을 사람들이 평화, 어, 평화를 지키기 위해서 평화예술, 평화운동을 했고 거기에 아티스트들이 함께 평화예술 운동을 했던 것 네, 그것이 가장 큰 기억에 남는 겁니다. 감사합니다. Can you translate? Yeah, Jamie. Yeah. yeah. Um... The most memorable one for me is, a 20, is an artwork from 21st century. In 2003, in Tetsuri, a small town in South Korea, there was American military, military, military base expansion um, agenda set by the government. And thousand people gathered together to protest against this in peaceful art movement. He, was, he took part of it as an archivist and archived the... Um, peaceful art movement. And he mentioned Camp Humphreys, which is the biggest uh, military, biggest and most powerful military base in Asia. And thousand people gathered to save their town from this expansion of the base. Let me just make a little correction there. Uh, thank you, very good. But thousand artists is a, support, a shocking news. A thousand artists for 얼마나 몇년 동안 했죠, 선생님? 그거? Five years. For five years, a thousand artists went to to show the solidarity, make a mural, stay there, create a museum, archiving the um yeah, and pro uh, confront protest with the farmers. That's yes, um, uh, it's a remarkably unprecedented action, which still it can take place in Korea. Um, that's very unique thing about Korea. Yeah, one thousand artists participated. For a period of five years, so he was uh, directly involved in that, and he's a big on archive. So the publication is available. I have in my archive, my bookshelf. Also, the YouTube video is pro uh, uploaded, and I translated that from Korean to English. If you type "dead churi," uh, there is a slightly bad resolution. Documentary film is uploaded there. Okay, next question is. 마지막 퀘스천입니다. 저희가 너무 시간 있지 또 자석 좀 떨려가지고요. 아두 개요. 어, 현장과 제대로 오가시는 그어이이 이, 저기 뭐야 어 활동을 계속 하셨잖아요. 근데 거기에 가능성과 한계에 대해서 짤막하게 얘기해 줄수 있는지. 예. So my question is, you are actually known for uh, shifting, uh, moving between the establishment as um, as actually gallery curator in the um, in the government funded establishment, and also those um, a, a, a field of struggle. And and I've been always admiring how come somebody not just stuck in one place but just moving freely. He does it very bravely, and he's just known for it. And uh, what is the possibility and limit of each of the practices? Okay, before that, I up uploaded the YouTube uh, link, which is translated by Soyang. So you can confirm it on the YouTube video clip. So mm, after that, uh, I would like to introduce, um, uh, we call it uh, Hyunjang, and then in Latin language, Art in Situ, Eng Situ Art. So in Korea, there are so many uh, political events. Until now, 
um, north and south is very uh, nervous uh, political situation. So, for example, as a chief curator in MMCA, National Museum, so I would like to invite a uh, peace art project, for example, DMG Art Museum. But uh, these days, uh, I gave up that peace art project because uh, even though I am the chief creator, but uh, until now, uh, the creators or director is not good at uh, peace art movement. So, uh, so I have to be late uh, to to fix uh, that kinds of anxiety to art in National Museum. Uh, 그래서 uh, 현장 미술 또 액티비스 아트를 주류 미술에서 실천하는 것은 여전히 한계가 있다라고 생각을 합니다. 그리고 그것은 uh, 이 미술사 또 미술관이라고 하는 제도. 그 속에서 즉각적으로 자리 잡기보다는 계속해서 어, 이 필드에서 운동 형태로 존재하고 그것이 다시 제도 안으로 들어온 데까지 일정 정도 갭이 있는 것이죠. 그래서 이것을 메꿔 나가는 것이 필요한데 어, 국립미술관에 어, 집 큐레이터로 들어와 있으면서 끊임없이 상상합니다. 필드를. 음, 지금까지도 그리고 그런 긴장 관계를 어떻게 어, 메워줄 것인가 그것이 저의 역할이다 이렇게 생각하고 있습니다. Thank you. 재미 저기 할수 있겠다 있겠죠? Yeah, I'll try my best. <laughs> um, activism art is has its limitation in the mainstream art history. Um, it, doesn't really exist in art history and instead it needs to exist in the field in its um, true essence and his job as a curator who goes who works in the main who works in the mainstream art institution is to uh, work on how to relieve this tension between the field art and art history that is still ongoing and he also said that he always misses the field and um, he deal with, try to deal with the tension all the time. So he confront the tension between the two all the time. I think that was nice ways to end. Singim, 감사합니다. 그거 딱 맛보기로 너무 좋았습니다. 감사합니다, 선생님. 저기 이 시간이 너무 어중간한데 저희가 너무 늦어져가지고 마지막 하나 더 발표자 보고. 아, 어, 어, 저희 오늘도 하루를 마감해야 되거든요. 아쉬우시죠? 다음에 꼭 와주세요. 아니, 아니, 음. 너무 감사합니다. Thank you very much um, um, for joining us. You are very, very uh, honorable surprise guest. Thank you. 감사합니다. 예. Yeah. <웃음> Bye. <웃음> Bye. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next presenter. Uh, last presenter, Max Chu. Max, are you ready? So we don't see Max in the participant slots. Oh, really? I think it Max is, um, well, yeah. you know what? If, uh, if Max is uh, um, determined because it was outside of the uh, time, right? It was 6.15, so maybe she, oh, where's the Max? Uh, so we don't have a Max here. Right, so that actually um, make us to, um, you know what, I was going to make a suggestion, if possible, we can move Max's presentation tomorrow because uh, tomorrow we have one more day and then tomorrow we have a shorter number of uh, presenters. And uh, so I think it will be perfect fit. But while I'm saying that Max may be joined from bathroom, no? Max? Max is not here? So Jamie, Jessica, and I noticed that Max wasn't here, I think, an hour ago. So it would be best to move them. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah. OK, so um, let's do that. The time is up and after. So 
Um, thank you very much for those who actually remained to stay and join the uh, forum. And it was a very rich and long uh, day and with a uh, lots of conversation and discussions. So um, hope to see you tomorrow and where you, we have a like amazing, again, the presenters um, and Professor Imoni Man will be opening uh, with Lillian the sessions and, um, and be ready to be inspired and the participate in conversation. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I will see you tomorrow. Can I say bye? <laughs> thank you. Bye, thanks a lot. And uh, those, um, the coordinator, let's meet in the coordinator's rooms for to quickly back uh, wrap up. And the presenters, thanks a lot for today. And I will see you tomorrow. We're gonna have a different maybe party online, but Maybe not today because we have one more day. <laughs> so thank you very much, Angelina, Jesse, and everyone who remained to say thank you. Thank How you, everyone. Hope, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining from different time zone. And um, uh, uh, everyone, I will contact you later. Thanks. <laughs>